Hey guys, Sam Miller from Panel Precision. Welcome back to the Precision Rifle Load Development Series. Okay, in episode 6 we're going to talk about pressure and velocity. I'll share with you some of the ways that I look for too much pressure and how I approach backing off from it. Uh, we'll also go over a big test I did with some 140 grain bullets to see what this barrel was capable of before it hit that pressure ceiling. Okay, before we get rolling, I'd just like to ask that you subscribe to this channel, like this video, and if you have any comments or questions about it, please leave them in the comment section below the video. Uh, furthermore, if you need more information on reloading, be sure to check out penoutprecision.com. There's an entire reloading section there. A lot of articles, a lot of how-to stuff, as well as some reviews. Uh, this channel itself has an entire reloading section, a playlist, as well as a playlist that I put together just for this load development series. So if you've missed some of the other ones or you want to get caught up, be sure to check out that playlist. This is number six in the series. Okay, when we talk about pressure, I think most people think that's a bad thing. And, you know, the way we talk about it, sometimes it sounds like it is. So maybe we'll say we're going to take it up to pressure and then we're going to back it off. Well, that's not entirely true. Pressure is what makes velocity. You have to have pressure. The key is figuring out when you have too much pressure and how to... Uh, get rid of that too much pressure before it becomes a problem. So that's kind of what this video is all about. Okay, so this is a load profile from the ballistic software program Quick Load. My buddy Sean hooked me up with this little graph to help explain and demonstrate what a curve looks like. Uh, you can see we built this just on a 260 Remington with 140 grain Burger VLD with 42 grains of H4350 and an overall length of 2.830. So what this is showing us is where the peak chamber pressure occurs, as well as what it is in PSI. So this is just around 60,000 PSI, which is SAMI max for a 260 Remington. And then the blue line indicates our bullet velocity while it's still inside the barrel. So it's predicting that with that load, we're going to peak out at 60,000 PSI. Our bullet is going to get up to about 2,800 feet per second by the time it leaves the barrel. And the whole thing is going to take place in about 1.3 milliseconds, which is 1.3 thousandths of a second. So it's pretty quick. Uh, a lot of things you can do with this program. Uh, a lot of things you can't do with this program. But it'll get you started at least if you want to try different powders. But like any other program like this, it's predictive. So it's just giving you uh, a reasonably accurate idea of what would happen if you added this much powder uh, with this burn rate. So... If you want to look into getting a program like that, I can see where it'd have its uses. I'll probably end up getting it just because it's kind of cool to look at and uh, mess around with different stuff. But uh, I don't really think of pressure in terms of these kinds of numbers. I just think of pressure as, uh, am I too high a pressure? Is it killing my components? Or do I have room to come up still? But anyway, if you're interested in, in looking at stuff like this instead of buying different powders and actually shooting them and trying them, Quick load's probably a pretty good shortcut to getting that done. Okay, like the rest of the videos in this series, this one's going to be based on this rifle. This is my PRS competition gun that I just built. It has a, a Surgeon 591 action, which is similar to a Remington 700 action. It has a two lug bolt and a spring loaded plunger ejector. So the pressure signs that I'm going to demonstrate and the bolt manipulation that I'm going to demonstrate has to do with using this action. Okay, the two things I'm going to look for as far as high pressure goes are both right here in the bolt. Uh, number one is just how does it feel when you open the bolt after firing the round? Does it feel normal? Uh, number two is a, a, an ejector mark left on the case head. So what happens is when you fire this round, that uh, case is pushed back against the bolt and you shoot it and everything works fine. If you have too much pressure, the brass literally tries to flow into the ejector hole it uh, literally goes into that ejector hole and it leaves a mark on the head of the case. And when you have that, you have too much pressure and you need to back off. So those are the two things I look for. Now you'll hear guys say that you can look at primers and you can see when they start to round off and they start to flatten off and all that. And I suppose that works too, but to me, it's very subjective. Uh, you know, it's you looking at something and judging how much of a curve is on the edge of your primer. I've never liked doing it that way. Uh, some primers show really well that way, some primers don't. So you can get to where you have a bolt lift that you can barely open the bolt on and your primer still won't be flat. So uh, I don't think that's a good way to look. I really like bolt actions with a plunger ejector like that because they give you a very 
obvious sign that you need to back off a little bit. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. Uh, I actually took some shots on video and then we'll look at some of these cases. Alright, so I'm doing a little bit of velocity testing out the window here just because it's convenient and I'm tired of laying in the snow. But uh, the last string I shot, I had these uh, 130 grain AR hybrids seated right on the lands just trying to get up some pressure without blowing anything up. And on the last string, I got a few heavy bolt lifts in the first few shots. So this string is almost a full grain higher. So I'm hoping that I'll get some pressure to demonstrate. But uh, anyway, what I'll do is I'll run five through it. I have 10 rounds loaded up exactly the same at 43.8 grains H4350. And what I'm gonna try to do is see if I get any kind of heavy bolt lift and pressure signs like ejector marks. And then if I do, what I'm going to do is go into the reloading room and I'm going to seat my bullets exactly 10 thousandths deeper and see if all that pressure goes away. Oh yeah, heavy. It's really hard to open it and then it breaks loose once it clears the lugs. So uh, the, the round will extract and have a nice shiny ejector mark. So what I'll do is I'll run through the rest of these and then I'll get somewhere where I don't have all this backlighting and show you what the ejector marks look like. Another heavy one. Now these rounds are seated right to the lands, right touching the lands. Nice heavy bolt lift. Very good ejector mark. Another one. And another one. So basically all five of those shots had a heavy bolt lift and an ejector mark on the case. So I'll have some good stuff to demo. So I'm gonna go ahead and seat the the remaining five uh, rounds exactly ten thousandths deeper and shoot those two. Alright, so these five, uh, all I did was I seated them further in, so further into the case. It actually turned out to be about twelve thousandths more. And now I'm going to shoot these and see what we get. Bolt doesn't open hard. Just a tiny bit of swipe on the on the case head. Again, the same way. That one's got a swipe. I think we found our max with this bullet. All right, let's go check them out. All right, so these are the 10 shots that I just fired uh, from the tripod. The ones in the front, so the, the ones at the bottom of the screen there, are the ones that came out with the heavy bolt lift. So they were seated into the lands with 43.8 grains of H4350. The ones behind it were seated about 12 thousandths off the lands with exactly the same charge weight. Both of them were 130 grain AR hybrids. So basically the only thing I did different was seat the bullets out further. 
and all it really bought me was no heavy bolt lift so not as much primer flow so when you get that heavy bolt lift what's happening is that uh, case head is going so far into the primer pocket that you're actually shearing that brass off of the case head as you rotate the bolt so uh, you can have ejector marks with no heavy bolt lift and you can have ejector marks with heavy bolt lift and it's just a degree of too much pressure <laughs> they're both too much pressure but anyway I'll see if I can get the camera to zoom in a little bit better on a couple of those okay this one right here this guy that one is the most pressure probably the best sign of pressure out of all these cases you can see there's black around that primer cup and that's actually from gas trying to leak out around that primer so there's no doubt in my mind that that case is torched that uh, head diameter has grown so much that it probably won't hold a primer at any rate, I'm going to toss that piece of brass. That was just for uh, scientific purposes to kind of show you guys. But you can see the you can see the the clear ejector mark just to the left there, and you can see where the bolt actually sheared off a little bit of that. You know, the, the ejector hole actually sheared off a little bit of that brass when I was rotating the bolt to extract it. So the other two or the other three on you know two on the right side and one on the left, you can see the ejector marks, but not as much shear but all all five of these in this row definitely have heavy bolt lift all right here's a bonus case this one came out of my savage lrp and 260 remington that is a remington case so what happened with this one was i ran the cases too long and uh, probably at too much pressure even without having ejector marks and because the case heads are much softer on the remingtons they don't they don't uh, withstand as much pressure for as long so this is a Remington case and when I fired it the primer actually fell out of the case so when I ejected it and it was laying on the ground there was no primer in it which is a really good sign that that brass is done alright here are some case heads that had no pressure signs whatsoever and you can see if you look at those primers very carefully I'll rotate this case back around to where we had the ejector marks and you can tell me if you see any difference in the primers uh, granted this is a surgeon action with a nice tight uh, firing pin hole and it has a smaller diameter firing pin so I don't have any flow whatsoever around that firing pin into the the firing pin hole or bore in the bolt but still I don't see a whole lot of difference between the edges of the primer cups on these and on the high pressure ones okay there's the high pressure ones take a peek at those primer cups you can still see, I mean you can see they're still rounded you know when they flatten off what happens is that just turns into a mass so you have your primers are flat and they go all the way out and just line up with the case heads but you can see these all obviously had high pressure heavy bolt lift ejector marks and everything and those primers still aren't flattened alright so these are set at 43 and a half grains H4350 and set to the lands uh, the ones with no pressure at all were 43 grains and seated to the lands and then the only ones that I backed off the lands were the second five round string of 43.8 so this middle row here, the, the 10 rounds, were seated right to the lands and 43 and a half grains H4350, shooting the 130 hybrid. So you can see that there's only two of them, and they have very light ejector marks, barely visible. But those need to be backed off because I don't want to mess with any kind of ejector marks and then start putting things like uh, water and dust and extreme heat into the equation. So you know I want a little bit of wiggle room so I think 43 grains seated to the lands is my max load with that bullet in this rifle. Now these cases are fine I'd have no problem at all reusing them uh, the, the ones that I torched that I got the heavy bolt lift on I'm probably just going to toss all 10 of those. Now a lot of guys will take a small file and file off that ejector mark on there and run the brass again and it works I do it I mean, sometimes I don't even file that off you know it'll just come off the next couple of times you shoot it but uh, I know at least one of those primer pockets is loose so I'm not going to mess with any of them okay so that's what I'll be looking for when I'm chasing that max pressure in this rifle as I go throughout this load development process and I'll adjust accordingly so in this case if I wanted to run that bullet in this rifle I would know that I need to back off at least a half grain below that 43.8 and then be sure I'm seated off the lands. Now one thing I've noticed about the seating depth, uh, it will affect your pressure in any given load, but if you start at 10 thousandths off the lands and move closer to the lands so that you're actually touching them, your pressure can go up, 
but if you go from 10 thousandths to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, your pressure isn't going to go up. So uh, something to keep in mind, typically pressure doesn't increase as you move away from the lens. In fact, it's probably the exact opposite because you have more of a running start for that bullet to get started down the bore. Uh, if you look at that pressure curve on that graph, the one thing that it doesn't, that you can't adjust in quick load is the amount of jump that you have from the from the case to the lands with that bullet. So I think it's assuming that it's an instant contact with the lands and the pressure just starts to come up. So I'm sure that can be adjusted. Now a little bit of personal experience with that. I had a 260 that was originally designed to shoot uh, 148 maxes. I had a really long throat and there was a Wyatt's box extended magazine in it and all that kind of stuff. I changed that around and that became the original 260 that turned into the 260 Terminator and I had bottom metal on it that was designed for AI mags. So we didn't change anything in the barrel. We kept running that long throat, but now I had to see it at an overall length of 2.830. So my jump with 130, 140 grain burger hybrids was almost a quarter of an inch. That's how far I was jumping to get to the lands. But I still pressured out at about the same place that I'm pressuring out with this gun, where I only have 10 thousandths jump, but the same uh, basic load structure in that case as far as the amount of powder, the primer, the case I'm using, and the overall length. So that tells me that 200 thousandths jump or 10 thousandths jump, the pressure is probably not going to be too much different, or at least it's not going to be something that I can measure by looking at my cases, and it's certainly not going to increase the further I, away I get from those lands. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Alright, so let me back up for a second and just underscore the, the fact that if you are on the lands and you back off, say, 10 thousandths or 20 thousandths, and your pressure, your heavy bolt lift goes away at least, or your, or your ejector signs, your ejector marks on your cases goes away, don't mistake that moving another 20 thousandths away will get you off of pressure if you're already off the land. So the most useful time to adjust your seating depth is when you're already into the lands, whether you know it or not, which I've seen and I've personally experienced. Uh, but anyway, getting off the lands and getting a jump to the lands is a pretty quick way to drop some of that pressure. But moving further away from the lands when you're already off of them doesn't do much. So the biggest thing and the fastest way to get away from overpressure is to drop your powder charge. Uh, depending on the size case you're using and depending on the burn rate of the powder, uh, you'll come up with a little formula that gets you off of that pressure mark. Now with H4350, if I'm, if I'm getting ejector marks on every case and a heavy bolt lift, I know I need to move at least half a grain away from it. If I have ejector marks at all, I'm going to move at least two tenths of a grain away from it. Probably half, just to be sure I'm completely out of that zone. But uh, anyway, the bullet seating depth, it's most effective when you're into the lands and you come off of them. When you're away from the lands and move further away from the lands, it's not so much of a big difference. In other words, if you're overpressured, 20 thousandths off the lands with 43 grains H4350, moving 40 thousandths off the lands isn't going to get you out of the pressure. So you need to back off on your powder. Now when I change bullets, I go through this whole process again. I don't start low. I start somewhere up. If I'm running 140 grain bullets and say I have a, a burger hybrid, 140 grain hybrid, and at 43 grains, it doesn't show any pressure. Uh, and I want to try 140 grain ELD. I might back off to 42 grains and then go 42 and a half and then all the way up to 43 and look for pressure signs. Uh, you don't have to back all the way down and then start ramping back up because the bullets in any given weight class are going to be similar. But if we look, when we go into this next 140 grain test I did, you'll see that even though they're pretty similar, they give some very different velocity results. Uh, only, I think, two of the bullets pressured out on the same exact load that I worked up for all of them. So it'll be pretty interesting to, to see how that turns out. Okay, so that test was intentional. I knew that I was going to hit pressure at 43.8, and I knew it was going to be probably pretty big pressure. Uh, I would not take a, a round up to that intentionally while I'm doing load development. I just did it for the video. So at 43 grains on the lands, I had a couple of them where I saw some ejector marks, so I knew I was getting up towards the top. Now, typically, I wouldn't be running it into the land, so I'd be 10 off. So at 43, I probably wouldn't have seen any pressure signs at all. And then at 43 and a half, I started to see a few more pressure signs. I think about 50% of the cases came out with pressure signs on them. 
seated on the lands. So I think probably what I would have done there if I would have been 10 thousandths off the lands and I just had a couple that were starting to mark up, I might have backed off a couple of tenths. But when you get into the, the, the part, you know, into the, the process and you're ramping up and you go a little too fast, a little too far, and you get all primer or ejector marks on those cases, you've gone too far and you need to back off at least back down to where you had no signs at all. Now, you know, inside the house it was 70 degrees, so I wasn't testing them at 25 or whatever it was outside, so that was a good thing. But even though H4350 is temperature insensitive, it's not perfect. So, you know, if you're right on the ragged edge of pressure at 70 degrees, you might have a problem at 100. And it's not that it's a, you know, not from a danger standpoint, but it's hard on components. You know, you're going to wreck all your cases, but uh, if I see it at any temperature, even at 25 or 30 degrees, at 70, whatever, I'm going to back off so that I feel comfortable when it gets hot outside. And my experience with H4350 has told me that if I don't have any pressure signs at all, and I've already found them and backed away from them, then I know I'm going to be good to go in the summertime when it's in the 90s or whatever around here. But you should tailor your loads to your shooting conditions. And if you aren't familiar with the the temp sensitivity of the powder you're using, approach it slowly and know that as you go up in temperature, your pressure and velocity are going to follow that temperature if the powder is sensitive to changes. And then vice versa, if you're running a, a temp sensitive powder and you work it up in the summer at 90 degrees and then long range hunt with it in 20 degrees, you might have dropped off quite a bit of velocity. So it's something you ought to test with any powder you use. All right, this video isn't even out and I'm already starting to get a lot of questions about it and a lot of it has to do with, with pressure signs. So what, you know, what if I have a good load and everything's fine and I've shot 100 rounds of it and I've never had any pressure signs and everything looks good and then all of a sudden I run another batch across the bench and I have pressure signs now. What does that come from? Well, that could come from a lot of things. I can't tell you over an email. So uh, the things you want, you want to focus on are the fundamentals. Are you sure that you didn't seat into the lands where you weren't seated into the lands before. Uh, are you sure you're throwing exactly the same powder charge? Are you sure you're using the same primers from the same lot? Uh, another thing that I've seen but have never experienced is a guy will uh, not want to trim his brass. So you'll start shooting, 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 and then on on a particular reload, you're above the, the SAMI spec for the trim length, and your chamber where it's cut is cut to that or a little bit shorter. So when you, when you grew three, four, five thousandths or whatever over the last four or five firings, all of a sudden the end of your case is jammed up against the end of your chamber and it creates kind of a crimp effect on the bullet and that will jack your pressure way up. So that's something else to consider. Other things are the environment, you know, water, heat, things like that, getting into the chamber, warming up the powder, things that you didn't test for when you came up with your load the first time might come around to bite you in the ass. So uh, pay attention to those things. Another thing that I've seen guys do is they clean their rifles too much and they lube their bolts too much and they don't clean the excess out of the chamber area or they store their gun upside down and, and oil and stuff runs down the bore and gets into the bolt head and gets into the recesses behind the bolt and into the chamber and yeah, you'll get a lot of pressure that way especially if you get it up inside the neck, inside the chamber. So keep all that stuff clean. Uh, make sure the back of your bolt lugs stay clean and lubricated because that's where they get you know, all the force exerted on them from shooting and opening your bolt. Uh, they can give you a false sense of, of effort of opening the bolt if you run them dry. So make sure you keep that clean and lubed. Uh, there are a lot of things that will cause pressure, but I have never had a load that I worked up and tested as thoroughly as I usually do develop pressure all on its own one day. It, uh, it just stays shooting. If anything, it drops down as the throat starts to burn forward. So it's not normal for a load to all of a sudden increase in pressure unless something has either uh, changed the environment the gun's in or you did something on the bench. So, uh, you know, work in big lots of components, keep really good notes, and pay attention when you're reloading. Okay, so the first part of this load development process uh, pretty much revolved around 130 grain bullets. We tested the 130 grain ELDMs. I actually tried to do a pressure string on those uh, you know, several weeks ago to try to find a ceiling and I never found the ceiling. I actually ran into a compressed charge uh, state before I found the, the pressure ceiling. 
So I was a little surprised to hit 43.8 with 130 grain hybrids and be at my max pressure. Uh, in the last video, we played around a little bit with 140 grain hybrids. And uh, after that video, I shot a few more of them, especially over a chronograph, and it kind of opened my eyes to uh, maybe the benefits of the higher velocity in the 130s wasn't enough to overcome the velocity I can run 140s in this barrel. So I came up with a method to test uh, all the 140 grain class bullets that I had on hand with a similar load under the exact same conditions. So basically what I did was I, I said, Sam, you need to get through this new brass a little more quickly. You know, the video thing is starting to drag on. You need to get through that new brass, get into where you're sizing some brass, and get on with this process. So uh, it was snowing and it was raining, and I said, I don't want to go lay out in that crap. So I rigged up my tripod with a hog saddle, and I cleared a loophole through some trees so that I could shoot from my living room window out to my target backer. And what I did was I just took a, a box and put a three inch red, red sticker on it and got in some tripod practice standing. So uh, the test is nine different 140 grain class bullets, all loaded with 42 grains H4350 and all seated to 2.040 cartridge based ogive length. So everything is identical except for the bullet. I'm still working with new brass, I'm still working with CCI 250s. The temperature inside the house was 70 degrees. I had the wood stove going, it was nice and toasty in here. So the powder never changed temperature. It stayed exactly the same, so I have a very good baseline uh, for temperature at least, and the powder. And then I just shot them. I shot five round strings over a Magneto Speed version two, and recorded all the numbers, came up with the average velocities for every bullet, and then I checked them for pressure, and uh, noted everything down really well. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a chart real quick because it'll be easier for me to explain everything that way. All right, before we go to the chart, let's just go over the different bullets that I had on hand. At the bottom there, we have the Burger Hybrid Targets, and then above that, the Nosler 140 RDFs, the Burger VLD Hunting, the 140 grainers, and then a 140 grain ELD Match from Hornady, as well as the 143 ELD X. And over here is just the Plain Jane Sierra 140 SMK, uh, the Nosler Custom Comp, which is very similar to that 140 SMK, and then the Sierra 142 grainer SMK, <clears throat> and then the ELD Match, the 147 grainer from Hornady. Okay, here we go. This is for the 260 Remington Comp Rifle, 140 grain muzzle velocity test. Uh, all loads are loaded to 42 grains H4350. A CCI 250 is the primer. And it's all in new brass with basically no neck tension at 293.5. Uh, the cartridge based ogive length on all loads was 2.040, measured out to zero variation. So every one of them was exactly that length. The indoor temperature where I shot them from was 70 degrees. Uh, every one of these is a five shot sample. So the average, the muzzle velocity average is from five shots. Uh, I shot all of these with the suppressor on the end of the 260, but it is a 30 cal can. And in all my other testing, it has not changed the muzzle velocity on any of the rifles I've tried it on. So, this first column is the bullet that I used. The second column is the cartridge overall length seated at that CBTO. So you can see the, the, the difference in cartridge overall length between all of these bullets seating at the same jump to the lands. This next column is the bearing surface, so this is the length of the full diameter of the bullet, so where it is actually contacting the lands and grooves in the barrel. The next row here is the average muzzle velocity for five shots. So what I would do is I would shoot uh, five shots and then I would let it cool down for about five minutes, just long enough for me to load the next magazine, record all the numbers, and then shoot it again. And then I would let it cool down about 30 minutes between two test loads. And in every one of these I marked which one was the cold bore shot. And in the end, it mattered nothing, not at all. It didn't change at all. It fell well within the average muzzle velocity. So in this final row here, I marked whether or not I had pressure on any of the cases after shooting this load. And you can see I had two of them. So I had the 140 grain ELDM showed pressure, and the 147 grain ELDM showed pressure. The rest of them showed no pressure signs whatsoever using my ejector mark method and the heavy bolt lift. Uh, neither of these loads were a heavy bolt lift. There were just a couple of ejector marks on the cases out of the five. Neither one of them 
showed more than two. I think one was one case and one was two cases. So what does this show us? <laughs> well, it shows us that this barrel will shoot 140s uh, pretty quickly. So at 42 grains H4350 uh, and no neck tension whatsoever at 70 degrees, it's uh, spitting them out pretty quickly. So the slowest one was the Sierra 142 grain Match King at 2835. And the fastest one was the 143 grain ELDX at 2877. That's pretty good velocity out of 140 class barrels or 140 class bullets. Uh, shooting them out of a 26 inch barrel, at least in my experience. Now, uh, when we get back over to the bench there, I'll go through some more of my notes, but I actually took the 140 hybrid up and beyond this test and got those bullets cooking right about 2950, if I remember right, with no pressure. So that's pretty interesting. Now, keep in mind, none of this is an accuracy test. This is just a, a way for me to shoot this many rounds and get some useful testing out of it just to see how fast these bullets will go in that particular barrel. Okay, so you see on that chart where I, I listed out the cartridge overall length of all those different 140 grain bullets when loaded at CBTO of the exact same length, so 2.040. Uh, in my last Straight Talk video, I went over cartridge overall length versus CBTO again, and I instantly got a lot of questions about uh, how consistent should I be when I'm measuring all those measurements. And, you know, I... I have my own feel when I'm actually using the modified case in the barrel and I've got a lot of experience doing it with a lot of different barrels so I, I know how to get repeatable results but I could see where guys would have a hard time with it. But I wanted to see how much difference there would be in a broad range of bullets in the same barrel. So what I did was I came up with a chart and I'll put it up on the screen right now and uh, basically I just took those bullets and measured them. And they were some of the same ones that we just talked about. And I think I threw the 130 grain ELDM in just because. But what I did was I measured three of them in the barrel with the modified case, wrote down all three measurements, uh, put the average of those three measurements out there on that far right column, put them all together like that, and then I added up all of those different lengths and averaged them out to the nearest one thousandth while I was adding them up. So the number at the very bottom is the average cartridge-based ogive length of all of those bullets using three measurements on each of the of the bullets and then putting them together. So you can see that there isn't a whole lot of variance between all of those different bullets when, as long as you keep your your measurements consistent. So using the equipment is key. Uh, practicing it until you can get repeatable results is key. Now I understand the different bullets giving you different readings within the barrel but if you're getting different readings that are really far off while you're doing one bullet in that barrel, then that is all on you. It's not, the, it's not so much the caliper or the comparator or the bullet insert or the bullet or the modified case. Now one of the things that's really helped me get consistent cartridge-based ogive length measurements in a barrel is going to a sized uh, modified case. So in other words, like I showed in the, I think the second video, firing that case and then bumping the shoulder back two thousandths and full length body size in it which is exactly what I'm going to do to all my loaded ammo anyway so what that has given me is a modified case that slips into the chamber easily and that contacts the front chamber shoulder with the shoulder of the case every single time the same way so as long as your chamber is clean as long as that case is clean you should have a repeatable measurement when you have it seated in there. So that has helped me quite a bit. If you're running a modified case that's fired but not sized, I almost guarantee you your, your measurements are going to be off. Uh, every time you pull that case back out and stick it back in, the amount that you can actually force it into the chamber is going to vary a little bit. So uh, while you could take a fire case and stick it in the chamber and close it with a bolt, you might not be able to get a modified case with your fingers to seat all the way up against the shoulder every time. So uh, either a brand new case or a sized, full length sized and bumped modified case gives me the most consistent results. All right, so what do I do now? <laughs> uh, got a lot of options at least. They shoot those bullets uh, fast enough that I've discovered that having 140 gram bullets isn't gonna hurt me as far as velocity goes and I can't push the 130s fast enough, nor do I really want to to overcome the BC advantage of some of these 140s. Now I took these 140 grain hybrid targets up to about 2950 without any kind of pressure signs, which is pretty fast. 
in my experience, in a 260 barrel, a 26 inch one, that's not improved. This is just a standard 260. But, as of right now, I think it's March 11th or 12th, I can't buy Burger 140 grain hybrids. And I can't buy the VLD Huntings, and I can't buy the 130 hybrids. Uh, there are no burgers to be had, in quantity at least. So, uh, as of now, I'm not testing these anymore in this barrel. I'm going to have to move on to something else. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out uh, one or two of these bullets at a time and load up a little bit bigger batch in five round strings and just shoot them and see how they shoot as far as accuracy. And at the same time I'll shoot some, uh, some velocity tests over the magneto speed and see if I have good ES, see if I have uh, the same kind of velocity that I came up with on my impromptu testing. Now I've already done a little bit of that. I took uh, the RDFs, I took 45 RDF loads, nozzle RDF loads, to the range the other day. If my last 45 pieces of new brass, and what I did was I loaded up 10 shots of each load. So I just went from uh, 41.5 up to 42.5 in two or three tenths increments to see if there was a big difference. And what I did was I shot five into an accuracy test, and then I shot five with the magneto speed bayonet on. So what I found out was my aim point on the black diamond in that orange circle, it was pretty close with the magneto speed bayonet on there, but the accuracy is still a little shotgunny with the bayo on there, which is what I've found out with other rifles. So I test separately for accuracy and for velocity. But there's a few good groups on here, none of them are dogs, and all of these are seated to exactly the same length in new brass, so I didn't do any tuning whatsoever. So I know the RDF is in the play on this. I could probably use that and tune it to work in the rifle. Now, before that, let me see if I can find that target. I took several of the bullets and just shot an accuracy test, one five shot string each. So all of these would shoot well, and I have the 142 grain Match King, the RDF, the ELDM, the light one, and then the ELDX and the heavy ELDM. So I know all of those could be tuned to shoot well in this. So uh, it's not always a good thing to have a lot of options. All right, so anyway, it's time to pick a load. Uh, it's time to, to get down and, and grab one bullet and really start working with it. And it needs to be a bullet that I can buy in a large quantity. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pick a few of these and load up some test rounds, take them to the range, and just see which one performs the best, see which one I get a gut feeling that I want to use, and then just buy a bunch of them and start shooting this gun. Uh, I'm running out of time. I need to start practicing shooting over barricades. I need to get that load out to distance and check it to make sure that it uh, jives up with the BC and the velocity and then I need to work up a profile for it and do some trajectory validations. So uh, this is going to speed up really quickly. Uh, the next video coming up is one that I already have mostly prepared and it's all about uh, working with fired brass. So I'm going to take you through my my complete process from a piece of fired brass to a piece of sized brass ready to load. But uh, that one will come out soon after this video. Alright, if you have any questions or comments about this video, be sure to drop them in the comment section below the, the video description. Uh, until I see you next time, thanks for watching, and we'll see you later.